Grandma, can I have the chocolate chips? This secret recipe moment made possible by Emory Heart and Vascular Center. When Grandma needed heart care, she came to Emory. The difference? Emory Healthcare performs more heart procedures annually than anyone else in Georgia, which means better outcomes for our patients. And we offer advanced and personalized treatments developed by our top specialists that others don't. Like Grandma knows, where you start your heart care matters. Smart Cookie. EmoryHealthcare.org slash Smart Cookie. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. This is Matthew Ardell, and welcome to the Comedy Album Book Club Holiday Special. This year, I'm sitting down with filmmaker, musician, writer, and performer Emily Milling, as well as writer and performer John Burdesky. We're going to talk about our three favorite holiday films or specials, and you couldn't get a more diverse selection than this year. Emily selected Arnold Schwarzenegger's action extravaganza, Jingle All the Way. John selected the perennial holiday favorite, A Christmas Story. And I chose... The Colbert Christmas, the greatest gift of all. So pour yourself some eggnog, not forgetting the nutmeg, and sit back for this very special comedy album book club. Welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. Emily, John, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So uh, this year's Christmas special, we're doing... Jingle All the Way, A Christmas Story, and A Colbert Christmas. So let's start with you, Emily. Why did you choose Jingle All the Way? Oh, my God. Um, so Arnie. Of and course. also, me and my partner, Justin DeClue, love watching this movie every single year. We make it a habit. A habit. A tradition. It's a tradition. This is the title of the year for traditions. And so we have done that. And uh, I'm pretty sure I got him out of like the Best Buy $5 bin. I got him the DVD stop watching it um it's such a ridiculous movie it's such a crazy thing and there's so many quotable moments and like you can't not quote Arnie. arnold schwarzenegger's film jingle all the way was released november 16th 1996 and was a diversion from the action star arnold schwarzenegger's usual action movie fair into the realm of family holiday entertainment Possibly one of his most friendly films, with the other exception being 1993's The Last Action Hero, Schwarzenegger was joined by a veritable who's who of talent in this film. Phil Hartman, Sinbad, Rita Wilson, Jim Belushi, Martin Mull, Harvey Corman, Lorraine Newman, and early performances by Chris Parnell, and young Jake Lloyd before his effectively career-ending role in The Phantom Menace. Filmed in Minneapolis and St. Paul with scenes shot in the Mall of America before returning to California to finish filming, the film was distributed by 20th Century Fox and produced by 1492 Pictures, Christopher Columbus's production company, producing everything from Bicentennial Man to the Harry Potter saga. Directed by Brian Levant and written by Randy Cornfield with an uncredited Chris Columbus, the film's budget is listed at between 60 and 75 million, it had a box office return of $129.8 million before adding in decades of streaming, television, and DVD sales. The film itself had a very truncated production schedule with Schwarzenegger as a late addition, leaving only six and a half months for the normal marketing push. The film debuted at the Mall of America and was head-to-head -head against Star Trek First Contact, Space Jam, and Ransom. In its opening weekend, it took in $12.1 million dollars. This was Phil Hartman's last film, and I suspect Jake Lloyd wishes it was his as well. So yeah. <laughs> that's why, in a nutshell, Turbo Man is super cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, Booster sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a crazy cast in that movie, too. I mean, you have, like, Lorraine Newman, like, you have some of the greatest comedians of a generation. It's true. Multiple generations. And the mom film. is 
the lady from Now and Then who plays Chrissy grown up. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. for all you Now and Then fans, <laughs> which I'm sure tons of you are listening to this. <laughs> yeah, well, you have like multiple SNL alum in there of, of mm-hmm. various years. Poor Jake Lloyd, like his one movie before his career imploded. Um, it's true. He's such a good little actor, that little guy. <laughs> So he cute. just, he's so, he was very earnest. Oh, you know, it, he makes me want to cry. It's like, I, I, I actually feel sorry for, like, him and the guy who played Jar Jar. They just had their careers <laughs> destroyed by one, one movie. Character. <laughs> yeah, one movie. It's funny, like, I, it came, came out, what, like, 95? Uh, 96. So, like, like peak Arnie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Everyone, everyone's just like, it kind of, like, feels like The Rock. Like yeah. everyone's just like, <laughs> yes. w- whatever he's in, I don't even care. And it was, I just want to get in it. He joined <laughs> like the shiny thing. He joined the production with like six months before the release. So like he was r- really wow. cast late in the production. <laughs> so it, they, they made a limited run of 200,000 Turbo Man toys. <gasps> wow. And it's really hard to get your hands on those. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but it, apparently like, it was like some super limited run. But I mean, that, that, that Wintertainment parade. Mm, is yeah it's so over the it's top. so far-fetched it's so unreasonable and the, the jetpack suit do you remember that part <laughs> yeah, where i don't just like so like they put him he's like running around he's trying to impress his son and get him this turbo man doll and then he finally he like runs away from a cop that he's been like physically hurting the entire movie and so he he runs away into this like warehouse area and they start suiting him up in a turbo man suit and they're like, oh, the uh, we fixed the uh, the jetpack thruster on this guy. <laughs> Sorry about the other guy. It was a terrible accident. But you'll be fine. And then he's like, what am I doing? And then he realizes he's Turbo Man in this parade. Right. And he's like, I have to give this doll to my son. And uh, and the guy, I can't remember the bad guy's name, but um, uh, what's his name that plays the mailman? Sinbad. Sinbad. Yeah. Sinbad, <laughs> who plays the mailman. But you know it's like, quality entertainment when Sinbad oh, is man. the bad guy. He's like... like He's like hellbent on also getting it for his son because they're both competing for their son's love with each other. It's ridiculous. And so then, so he dresses up as the bad guy and then um, Arnie has to save his son from the bad guy with this jetpack thing. And they're flying all over the place straight through people's houses. It's insane. It's insanity. It's so much entertaining fun. So much entertainment. <laughs> I love it's it. It's like nothing like a little bit of light, you know, kidnapping and, and child endangerment for a yeah. holiday movie. <laughs> Just hijinks. Yeah. And I, I, there's a couple... Oh, a, there's a couple things that really amaze me about this movie. The first being they found somebody bigger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is a tall man as well as a strong man. And they found somebody who's good, like, foot taller than him. And, like, not with weird proportions, but, like, stacked like he is as mm-hmm. well. That was astounding. Like, I'm like, how do you find that? Like, yeah. that guy's got to be, like, seven foot. You know? uh, walking to the gym, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Arnold, do <laughs> you have any big friends? <laughs> oh, let me check my yeah. Rolodex. Invite uh, your muscle man friends over. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh. uh, and it's, 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 it's for, like, for like family fun. It is a hyper-violent movie. Oh, yeah. yeah it's like, like, but so is Kindergarten Cop. Yes, yes. But, I mean, I is it feels like uh, right before this, he did, did Last Action Hero. Mm. Uh, which is, but that feels like a pivot point in his career where he's trying to get away from the more action stuff. And like, he's, I think already by this point, he's probably planning his gubernatorial run. So he's like, I got to uh, make myself a little bit more family friendly, not murder machine yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> like, so, but yeah. He's so goofy. <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he won. Yeah. He did. He did. He wasn't that bad a governor, I'll say. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I think... I mean, I don't have any hard uh, hard stats on it, but all I remember is like a quotable quote was like, he's like, I just love cranes. Like, I love to see cranes because it means we're building. Oh, and I was like, yes, at its most basic form. Yes, that is building. You should come to Toronto. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think uh, you know, the Ford family used that exact quote at some point. So they, yeah. they ripped off yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger at some point. But yeah, like in this movie too, it's like, it's so tonally uneven. Like it's Christopher Columbus. He's technically <laughs> not credited on, credited on there, but it's his production company, and he's an unlisted writer. But mm. so I, my guess is he wrote, fixed the script, and then just didn't take a credit mm-hmm. on it. Um, but you've got 
Phil Hartman as possibly the sleaziest neighbor. <laughs> ever. Balthazar, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it's like it just like literally you in the way, it, but it's charming. Like it's Phil Hartman at his best. So it's like you know it's a you know like in Street Fighter when Raul Julia died <laughs> immediately after that. It's like oh. We'll never see him in a great role. His last role is M. Bison in the Street Fighter movie, and they're terrible. But pause for getting the cat out of the room. Get out of here, you monkey. There we go. All right. Meow. Set and post. Um, yeah, so you get like Raul Juliet, but, but this one is like even as bad as the rest of the movie can be at times, it does have a charm. And Phil Hartman is part of that charm. I disagree with your statement, but go on. <laughs> but Phil Hartman is part of that charm. It's like, it's he's playing like the ultimate Phil Hartman character, the sleazy, entitled, douchey guy mm. who thinks he's right. Like whatever reality he lives in, in his, real, his mind, he's, he's right. And he's like, oh, you know, she just doesn't understand she's into me yet. And it's like just so gross. Well, I mean, like that's very typical male behavior of that time. True. And I hope True. not now. Men, <laughs> you make a note. If you let, behave like Phil Hartman, right. you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Truly, it's gross. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just like he's so great. And I'm trying to think, Sinbad is actually kind of fun as a really unhinged character too. He was more than kind of fun. Okay, like he's great in that movie. Yeah. Everybody in this movie. Is off the charts, hilarious, fun, super great, all the time. All the time. And maybe it's because I'm watching it with my boyfriend and we're both like, ah, things that are inside jokes for us, but it's still very entertaining for us. <laughs> but it, that opening scene in the like the most insane off the hook Christmas party in any office ever. Yes. And he's like the one guy. You got like people making out on the mattress. Like warehouse floor. It's like floor. the Christmas party of uh, the Santa Claus, also. I feel like that's Ooh. every every Christmas party in any movie is like amazing. Yeah, it's was the like Christmas the party for time. Salesforce that amazing the other day? Uh, it was pretty nice, but um, I mean, like any any Christmas party with a crock and bush, you know, you know that that's gonna be off the chain. I'm like looking at this table of food. I'm like pizza, crock and bush. I'm like, I'm sorry, you don't go to a patisserie and get like these fancy. <laughs> like cream pastry puffs. cream puff thing <laughs> power for your christmas party yeah you know like uh, it's california though, or well no it's minneapolis st paul mm -hmm. but twin so, city twin, twin city so weird Love weird twin city. Yeah. <laughs> what other movies are even set there ever like none, yeah, none. Think of any. but it is frigid and probably guaranteed to have snow whenever yeah. they're oh, filming yes. that's yeah. true so and they, they true. yeah and they filmed Again, over a very short period of time. So they're like, okay, we got to get somewhere cheap. Get in, get out. Oh, also it has the Mall of America, mm -hmm. mm. which is where all the mall scenes were filmed, which is like the biggest mall in the world. Consumerism. Yeah. yeah. And that, really? that's the that's, thing. It's a whole movie. Like, <laughs> the, how? <laughs> what? How hard? Mind blown. <laughs> how hard must it have been to get the rights? Because like they had Disney characters. They had like warner brother characters i haven't seen that many like cartoon characters even if it is in their like dancing form of like parade outfits in one movie since like roger rabbit yeah that's mm. true it yeah. used to be like a fun thing when you were a kid and seeing them all in one place and maybe maybe someone was just like i want that magic back and spent far too much money on it at least yeah. that's the story i'm telling myself <laughs> or, or like they convinced them this is the next big arnold movie you let give us some money, we'll put your character in this movie, mm -hmm. and For that's sure. free advertising because everybody loves Arnie. That's it. Makes it. A lot so, sense than what I just said. So I can work out. But it's but but because we want to make bring it all together for the Wintertainment Festival. Wintertainment. <laughs> Wintertainment. Wintertainment. I'm like I would actually go to see that because that's just so freaking insane. And if it culminated in like an epic battle with a truly flight suit, so fucking cool. Show. You can you can swear all you like. Fuck, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fucking okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Uh, so what what stands out? Like you, you is a it's a movie that you God, you enjoy. How do I even tradition. how do I even start saying things that stand out? Like I like when um when he when he's um 
Jake Lloyd is talking to Arnie on the phone. And he's like, where's your mother? And he's like, she's across the street petting Ted. And then he gets really mad because Ted's the name of the reindeer, but also the name of Phil Hartman's character. And mm. I set that up really poorly, but it was really funny. That stands out to me. Ted's fight. And also Balthazar, he sets the like nativity scene on fire and then he kicks Balthazar's head <laughs> like out the w- flaming head out the window. <laughs> and Phil Hartman's like, no, Balthazar. He gets so upset about the whole thing. Uh, God, I don't know. Yeah. And, and for, I really for... love when the cop gets like brutally maimed. Like he should be dead. By oh, all accounts. Multiple. There was a bomb. Like he's, he's exploded. Bomb. Yes. And like later in the day at the winter fun fest parade, what is it? The winter wintertainment, f- wintertainment wintertainment parade. Um, he's there and the only thing he's got, he's got like some bandages wrapped around his hands and he's holding <laughs> two coffees and then Arnie smashes into him and he burns himself. <laughs> like this is the only thing that's a problem for him. He just continued working that day after a bomb situation. Oh my God. Um, what else stands out? I really love, like, okay, so you know when you're driving on the highway and you see people, like, shooting up the side on the shoulder? Mm -hmm. I always assume that it's, like, someone trying to get to their kid's black belt or yellow belt, (laughs) uh, presentation, because that's what Arnie does, um, (laughs) getting started in the movie. Like, he comes from his office and he's super late. You're my number one customer. And then he's, (laughs) he's driving up the shoulder of the road. That's where he meets For people who haven't seen the movie, everyone is his number one customer. Yeah. Everyone. Says it to his wife and she gets real mad. Good. Yeah. As she should. Yes. Those are all the things I could go on, but I won't. One of the things I kind of find (laughs) endearing about the film is everything, literally everything is dialed to 11. Like the, that nativity scene. It's not just a regular nativity scene. This is full size like mannequins yeah. spread throughout the house of Ted <laughs> right. in multiple rooms. It's like great. that's a it's crazy great. ass. That's so not great. that's an art installation. That's not a nativity scene. Well, they, yeah, they, they jingle all the way. All yes. the way, baby. Yes. Yeah. Now, our second film is sort of kind of a tonal opposite in a way. Yep, John, you chose a Christmas story. I did. So tell us what what made you choose that? Oh, a Christmas story. It's so nice, and it's so just so innocent. A Christmas story is for many a holiday tradition, up alongside Home Alone and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Based on the writings of satirist Gene Parker Shepard Jr., or Shep as his pen name. A radio broadcaster and professional satirist, Shep began his career in Cincinnati in the year 1945 before eventually landing in New York on WOR Radio. His radio career lasted until 1977, after which he made occasional appearances on NPR's All Things Considered, and in the mid-90s had a show on WBAI Radio reading his essays and stories. Shepard, friends of Shel Silverstein, Herb Gardner, and Lois Nettleton, is known to have inspired raconteurs Spalding Gray and Garrison Keillor, as well as influencing the works of diverse creators like Jerry Seinfeld, Bill Griffith of Zippy Comic fame, as well as being featured in Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media. Given this heady list of peers, protégés, and those inspired by him, it's almost ironic that in 1983, three-time Genie Award-winning American-born Canadian director Bob Clark whose other films include Monkey's Paw, Black Christmas, and possibly most famously Porky's, was tapped to direct the film. So once you understand the nature of Porky's, a recounting of Clark's own youth in Florida, the appeal of Shepard's work becomes obvious. There's a stylistic similarity between the two films. Where one is a body sex romp, the other is a Rockwellian ode. The screenplay was written by Gene Shepard, Bob Clark, and Lee Brown, and based on Shepard's book, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. The film starred Melinda Dillon, Darren McGavin, and Peter Billingsley, and was narrated by Gene Shepard himself. The film was budgeted at $3.3 million, with the majority of exterior shots in Cleveland, and the remainder shot in St. Catharines and Toronto, Ontario. The film turned in a modest $20.6 million. The modest profit was bolstered when Turner Classic Television began airing the film in 1986, exposing it to a much wider audience, and it's now considered one of the best films of 1983, and is a holiday favorite, one of the few films Leonard Maltin has awarded four stars. Vaguely set in the late 1930s or early 40s, 
the resurgent popularity led to a 2012 sequel set specifically in 1946. Like Aunt Clara's pajamas, this is something best to be avoided, or at least not to be seen enjoying by friends. I don't know. I just like it because it's like a simpler time, and you're like, yeah, maybe if I grew up in like the late 50s, early 60s, like things would be better. But they seem better, even though they like weren't. But like, I don't know. I just love the, uh, just how simplistic everything it is, and like the tropes of like, just growing up in like you know they're in like northern indiana or whatever but like it's basically like any town usa yeah and you're just it's everything's so relatable and tropey it's great it's uh, it, like gene shepherd who wrote or gene shepherd jr who wrote the book uh, right it's based on and wrote the screenplay yeah um, what's the name of the book again it's got a hilarious title oh um i did the research last night so did i Oh, in God we trust, all others pay by cash. Yes, that is a good title. Yeah. And it sort of sums up the Americana of this in so many ways, which is funny. Yeah. Because, I mean, although it's an American director, he's Canadian based. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, so it was uh, the Bob Clark who mm-hmm. directed Black, uh, Black Christmas? Mm. He's a horror director. Oh, it's he, only he, Justin DeClue were here. Yeah, he directed <laughs> yeah. Monkey Paw, uh, but most famously, he directed Porky's, which was kind of the same kind of movie in that it was because Porky's is essentially his recounting of his life growing up, right. much the way this was uh, Shepard's recounting of his childhood. So it's like, it, you think too, they couldn't be two different movies, but from a creative point of view, it's actually kind of synchronicity. Yeah. And that they're using a similar story method, and, and Clark actually cites Shepard as inspiration to him as a creator. Um, but it's like, yeah, I mean, the film was filmed in Ohio, but also Toronto and St. Catharines. So the, the Chinese restaurant scene, um, really? the tree lot, it's, you can see... Um, you can see a TTC streetcar going by in the background when the old, like two, yeah, it, like yeah, the yeah. old, old ones. Um, and they were still on the street at that time. And once again, the Chinese restaurants on Cherry Beach. No uh, way. And there's scenes where you can see like firefighters in the distance, like dealing with snow and stuff. But yeah, so it's like, it, and it's like a genie nominated film because it was essentially a Canadian film. Wow. So it's I had no picture. idea. I know. It's just like something feels right about this. Got her CanCon <laughs> in. Yeah. But yeah, like I, I just it's it, that's one that we watch probably at least twice every Christmas. Yeah, I feel like it really it does uh, of any Christmas movie. I feel like it actually gets me feeling Christmassy. Even though the older I get, the more Grinchier I, uh, I get. No pun intended. <laughs> He's turning green. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got a tinge of green. That's it. I'm starting to speak in rhyme. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's such a it's such a nice movie, and then like, what's like so relatable about it? At least like for me, I feel like for me, like growing up as a kid, is like he has like all these like fantastical, like, like imagination of like how scenarios are gonna go down. Whether it's he is going to get an A plus on yes. a test, and then get put on his classmate's shoulders and carried around like a hero, or if. Uh, you know, his dad's coming home and he's gonna like basically like beat the crap out of him type thing. And you're just like your your imagination just like runs like to the extremes every time when you're a kid. It is it was kinda of, is a very is grounded but fantastical. Like it's a grounded version of how a kid views reality in a way. Like their dad they don't really understand the swear words their parents are saying. Like when the, when yeah. the old man loses he um he just is like, rah, 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 yeah, rah, like in the furnace room. in the furnace room or yeah. yeah but then it's like but then at the the tire change scene so good oh, oh. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they but they they make it deliberately it's still understandable close enough to a swear that you know what he said yeah yeah you pretty much i mean you start laughing anyway so you pretty much just assume that's what he says yeah and and that entire meltdown of him just terrified yeah, and his blaming his friend and his brother, uh, like just like, oh no, we, 
Oh no! <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and then one of my favorite like like one of his like visions or imaginations is like when uh, he pretends or like he's thinking that he has gone blind. Yes, and he's homeless, from the soap. and he comes back in to their house, and he's like, "It was so poisoning." Yeah, the childhood vengeance <laughs> yeah, cycle. Like, Children like, are little psychopaths. Exactly. It's yeah, like, like they don't I'll have show the... you. So good. Yeah. And um, one of my other favorite scenes, and the something I love about that is like almost every scene can stand on its own. Definitely. Like, if you took it out, it could be a sketch. Yeah. Just on its own. So it's like, but it's interconnected. It moves forward, but every moment is precious. Yeah. In that film, which is just astounding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like my favorite with the fight when Scott Farkas, when he finally breaks. Yeah. Because that's how, like, bullies, bullies bully. Yeah. But, you know, they're not. The only thing between a bully and a victim of a bully is the a kid snapping. Yes. And when he snaps and beats the crap out of him, and, the, and his brother is like hiding under the sink because he's. Afraid yeah. he's gonna get in trouble, and the mom just like glosses it over. Yeah, and it's like, oh, this is kind of sweet. Yeah, and I can never, I can never get over how well they cast that bully. Like that kid, that kid is so punchable looking. Yes, like he looks like such an asshole, <laughs> and he's got like beady little eyes and like the old, like old school shitty braces. Yes, <laughs> and and his like sidekick. Yeah, in like the leather jacket yeah. and the the. Who paper boy like, hat kind of thing who's like a 12 year old like joe pesci yes <laughs> basically <laughs> like, oh yeah get away you know? yeah. uh it, it just they capture the dynamic of childhood just perfectly and it's funny because it doesn't it doesn't glaze over the commercialism of it like that christmas morning nobody's taking care everybody's just like tearing into those packages yeah but for some reason it doesn't feel gross because at the core of that there's still this love between all of these characters <laughs> Even if they're like, you know, Randy's passed out on the floor hugging his Zeppelin. Yeah. Kind of thing. They're, they're still <laughs> like, oh, there's some, there's some love there. Yeah. What What are some moments from the film that stand out to you guys? The biggest one for me is the fight. Mm. Is the snapping like, like I had a similar scenario. So like, for whatever reason, I don't know. It was like me and a couple of friends were like trying to like this is very classic like actually trying to do like a lemonade stand when we were like mm-hmm. like in grade like I don't know two or three or something on the streets of uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. <laughs> and uh and these like other kids in the neighborhood kept like fucking around with our our setup before we could even like get set up. Mm-hmm. So I would like I like got like a little like bowl with like soap in it to like wash the stuff and I brought it out and I went in and I got like glasses and when I came out, like this, the soap bowl was like flipped over. Oh, and I was like, so sad. I was like, God damn it! <laughs> and so I got, I went and got like, like mixed lemonade, like brought it out, and like one of the glasses is missing, and I, <laughs> and I, I snapped, like n- they were not in sight. They were very sneaky, and effective, <laughs> but I like snapped, and I just every swear word I knew, just like came out like at the top of my lungs. Like, people are just, like, poking out of their windows and just being like, what the hell? I'm like, fucking <laughs> son of a bitch. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Freaking out. So, like, when he's when he's punching the kid in the movie and he's just, like, he's, like, blah, 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 like just swearing every word that he can absolutely think of. I was like, yeah, I, I know what that feels like. And, and the, the, the funny thing about that, too, is, like, it's almost like the swears are the bigger concern for the family like yeah. the brother's more he was swearing like, yeah, that's yeah. what's fro- freaked him up yeah, more the than kids, the violence the kids are like on the other side of the fence and like what did he say <laughs> and, like, and, like flick brings the mom he's like oh no yeah. uh, do you have any moments in that movie that stand up to you Emily? this is the movie with the, the leg lamp right yeah yes <laughs> yeah that's what i remember yeah Regile. <laughs> it's italian like that. <laughs> that's all i remember <laughs> For, for me, it was, I think, the little orphan Annie decoder ring, because that's like the end of innocence for that character. Ralphie's like, oh, it's all a fucking lie. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, you know, it's sort of a pivot point in the film for his character in a way. Too, yeah. Where it's like, oh, no. Yeah. yeah it's like, this is, it's, yeah. all, it's all bullshit. This is all commercial make bullshit. Me, make me drink old tea. Yeah. Fuck you, Annie. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, Annie. It's true. Yeah. Little orphans. Yeah, so I, 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 they're the it's worst. It's such an it's such 
a, a, an amazing like, yeah and i mean it's shoe shoestring budget 3.3 million dollars was it yeah yeah it's it's like it's one of those films like blade runner did okay better than blade runner in the box office 20.2 million or 20.3 million in box office returns at 83 which is pretty good and this is just with a you know 3.3 million budget it's probably about a 15 million budget in today's film standards but turner bought up the rights to a bunch of that were under the mgm titles and just threw it on turner classic movies and revitalized this film. yeah like it just got in front of all these people who probably would have never seen it otherwise yeah like it's amazing was turner is turner classic movies a free channel was it a free channel for a while? I think it was basic cable for a long time. Yeah. So if you I had like probably basic like, cable, you'd, yeah. be, you'd get it. Maybe that was the uh, maybe part maybe of the... Over and over and over. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 Like it was on once a day. Yeah. You know, it was like, like the mummy. The mummy, always... yeah. Oh my God. I love that movie. <laughs> or the original Jumanji. But that's, <laughs> yeah. that's another podcast probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my Christmas uh, special... I chose was a Colbert Christmas, the greatest gift of all. The Colbert Christmas, the greatest gift of all, was released in 2008 as a Comedy Central special featuring Stephen Colbert, the star of their news satire show, The Colbert Report, and former correspondent of The Daily Show. Colbert had left The Daily Show in 2005 and spun off into his own series, also produced by Jon Stewart, called The Colbert Report which some feel eclipsed The Daily Show by leaning into the absurdity of Stephen Colbert's fictional, hyper-conservative version of Stephen Colbert. A graduate of Northwestern's University School of Communications, he found a love of theater while attending Northwestern and threw himself into the field, eventually resulting in a theater nerd-off with Aaron Sorkin on The Colbert Report. Originally studying to become a dramatic actor, he fell into improv, as many of us do. Starting in the campus improv team, No Fun Mud Piranhas, he soon joined Chicago's Annoyance Theater, a part of Del Close's Improv Olympics. Annoyance Theater relied heavily on absurdist and outrageous comedy, an influence clearly seen in the character of Stephen Colbert as played by Stephen Colbert. He eventually joined Second City. Despite a rivalry between Annoyance Theater and Second City, and given the opportunity for free classes, shot through the ranks, joining the touring company as Steve Carell's understudy and forming a collaborative unit with Amy Sedaris and Paul Dinello, with whom he collaborated to create Strangers with Candy. By 2008, the character of Stephen Colbert was firmly established. A blowhard parody of Bill O'Reilly and other Fox News personalities, the character was so sharp at times people couldn't tell if it was a joke, including Bill O'Reilly. This led to some rather hilarious and possibly embarrassing moments, including a White House correspondence dinner where Stephen went to town on the president, George W. Bush. Running from 2005 to 2014, the Colbert Report hit peak hype very quickly, in no small part thanks to Stephen Colbert's incredible stage presence. But his love of pop culture, stage, and song led to a hilarious send-up of vintage Christmas specials, commercialism and the war on christmas starring elvis costello toby keith john legend willie nelson and john stewart all as slightly fictionalized versions of themselves while feist appears as an angel and george went as santa in the special it is packed with songs by david haverbaum and emmy grammy and ASCAP pop music award winner adam schlesinger and performed by nearly all the cast Aired on November 23, 2008, the special was immediately released as a DVD with 20 minutes of extra footage as well as a video advent calendar. Sadly, the commercial parody, Buff Your Jingle Bells, was only on the broadcast version and is lost to those of us who only saw it on DVD. The special was well received critically, and its soundtrack was released on iTunes and was eventually used as part of a prank played by Colbert on Kanye West. December 3rd, 2008, Operation Humble Kanye started when Colbert asked his audience to download his album and make him the voice of this generation of this decade, in response to Kanye's self-proclamation that he owned that title. It briefly worked, displacing Kanye as number one on the charts until Colbert declared Kanye 
officially humbled on December 4th. If only Stephen had kept making music, perhaps this would have allowed Kanye a moment of self-reflection. And why this ended up on on my list is it's it's possibly the most realized satire of Christmas specials ever. Because I mean Colbert, Stephen Colbert is like, you know, came up through Northwestern University as a theater student who's like very aware of pop culture and stuff. And he just it's this pure send up of everything in America, right? And like it starts with this song by Toby Keith about a war on Christmas where Toby Keith is, you know, probably would just sing that in a completely unironic way. Right. But it's like so over the top. And so like this footage from like Santa Claus versus the Martians, (laughs) all of these like old cheesy movies mixed with like Vietnam war footage. It's just this total fuck you to like that, that hyper partisan bullshit that was going on at the time in like late Bush era. Right. Kind of stuff right before Obama came into power. And it was, it's just, it was over that. And you had like amazing music. Like it's all original music by, uh, can't remember the composers, but it's in my intro, but they are like, like, uh, Grammy award winning, Tony award winning composers. And pretty much everybody except for George Wendt, and and that's it. Like George Wendt is the only person who doesn't sing a song. But you've got Elvis Costello, mm-hmm. you've got Feist at her peak, uh, John Legend be- while he was sort of up and coming. Let's get to the book burning portion of this <laughs> on the DVD special features. Oh, yes, yes. Did you ever watch them? Yes, I did. And I mean, again, that's it's. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you got George, you got these great songs and the special features, which, yes. you know, this is sort of unique in that it literally has an ad for the special you're watching in the special <laughs> with 20 minutes of extra features and a, and a DVD digital advent calendar. And is and part of that being book burning, which again is a, they burn books that are like storybooks of bears. Yeah, because he doesn't like bears. Colbert, the big villain in this is a bear who keeps him in the yeah. uh, in in his his cabin, so right. he can't get away <laughs> and go to the special. It's, it's just like this. It's, it's it's great. I have a very great. fond memory of watching that on loop. Like you know, like log was such a big thing. Yeah, and that's what it is. It's like log, and they just like yeah. Throw bear books into yes. it yeah. so my brother got it for christmas and he left it on all christmas day and the grandparents kept looking over like what are we watching <laughs> and it was it's only like a 10 minute segment so it's like looping the exact right. same thing over and over again. yeah yeah it was entertaining to say the least yeah and again is and that's what i love about it. it's like it's just like last year i brought up this british parody satire adbc that was my favorite mm-hmm. last year which is a parody of the very sort of British concept of like the musical and the, and then like Jesus Christ superstar and that sort of, but this is, this was a, a satire of a moment in time that was both, both historic and contemporary. So it kind of brought them all together, making fun of like, you know, and Chris Colbert is a devout Catholic. Yeah. Like he's, he's, he's a progressive Catholic, but it, it is a big part of his, his upbringing and his personality. And he is a person of faith. And, yeah. He is not ashamed or or afraid to poke fun of that poke fun at the ridiculous elements, and like him and John Stewart doing the duet about <laughs> like you know uh, the about Hanukkah, which is possibly my favorite. I mean, there's a lot of good like Elvis Costello's duet uh, duet with him at the very end is like just actually heart wrenching when you listen to the lyrics and, but. Th- it's not my favorite. My favorite song is a thing called Hanukkah, and it's, you know we got pancakes or we got latkes. What are they? Potato pancakes. It's just entire the entire dynamic of of you know John Stewart sort of like self like self putting himself down, but in a funny kind of way, and then the like ignorance and sort of like complete like mindlessness of Colbert's character of Stephen Colbert is brilliant. So it's just it's a, it's one of those ones that I go back to every year. I did watch it last year under uh, direction of my brother, so I think he's on the same page as you. It's a it's 
an annual treat. Yes. For indeed. sure. And every year I get to watch uh, Feist get her balls. So that's, you know, another, another one. whenever a bell falls uh, or whatever. What, crap, what was it? Whenever a bell falls, an angel gets its balls or something like <laughs> whenever that. Whenever a bell rings, an angel gets its balls, maybe. Maybe. Because it's, uh, it's a like, play on the, Whenever yeah. a bell rings, an angel he gets, gets its wings. wings. Yeah, it's a play on, on, I think it's on falls, balls is the rhyme there. Because cool. Because when something drops. Sounds then, about right. Yeah, uh, yeah. And like, and, and you know Willie Nelson. Yeah, in that. it's so. <laughs> it's just like complete. It's like a four minute pot joke. Yeah, <laughs> like just like oh, yeah, yeah, pot and taxes because he broke <laughs> because he didn't pay his taxes that year. And he was like arrested, and it's like oh oh they're all making fun of themselves and, and like and John Legend's song is kind of sexy you know, and like not even a veiled double entendre like nutmeg. You know, the right. only yeah. cream I want to see you wipe off your face is my <laughs> nutmeg. I mean, like, that's not even, that's not even, that's just, that's an entendre. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not a double, it's just like, here you go, have fun. And all of it, like, so there's, it's, you know, I don't think we'd get something like that. Comedy Central did a special a couple of years later, which was okay. Had like Kroll Show and a bunch of the other stuff at the time, but it didn't seem have that kind of subversiveness mm. that you see here it was it was gross out humor it was like yeah over the top silliness but just not quite the same well we can only have our nostalgic things that really make us feel like it's christmas time right exactly right that's it all right well <laughs> i want to thank you both for coming on and you know hopefully we'll have you back sometime in the future to talk about more comedy stuff. Really? For sure. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>
Grandma, can I have the chocolate chips? This secret recipe moment made possible by Emory Heart and Vascular Center. When Grandma needed heart care, she came to Emory. The difference? Emory Healthcare performs more heart procedures annually than anyone else in Georgia, which means better outcomes for our patients. And we offer advanced and personalized treatments developed by our top specialists that others don't. Like Grandma knows, where you start your heart care matters. Smart Cookie. EmoryHealthcare.org slash Smart Cookie. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.